Well, Greenland was settled in the late 980s when Christianity was in the making in Scandinavia. With roots in Iron Age paganism without permanent institution and a cult led by the rulers, the settlers had to navigate between old traditions and new realities in the form of the up and coming universal church with a fixed religious program permanent institutions and a hierarchical ecclesiastical organization. Christianity not only brought new belief and new rituals, Christianity also influenced the social and economic structures, and in my talk today I will focus on the formative first centuries of the North Greenland society and discuss the interaction between the settlers and the church with focus on the structural changes that took place within the church and the consequences for the socio-economic structure of the newly established community. The term small churches has become more or less become an accepted concept in North Greenlandic archaeology and it refers to a group of churches uh, that were very small. They had an average floor space of about 10 square meters they, have, they were, the architecture cannot be distinguished from contemporary secular architecture. They were surrounded by circular or almost circular cemeteries, and um, which they were built in close connection to the dwelling of the farms they were connected to. In all, 18 farms with churches have been recorded in the two settlement regions Small churches alone have been recorded at seven farms in the eastern settlement, though some of the later churches may also have had predecessors that might have been one of the small types uh, of the small church type. Small church type. It was the landowning farmers who, from the very first, built the churches on their farms, and the relatively high number of recorded small churches indicate that most farmers had their own church. The development in the North Greenlandic church architecture is here exemplified by the three churches which have been recorded in Krasjasuk in the eastern settlement, identified with the farm Bratelli, where Erik the Red and his family settled around 985. And where this is. Um, the last church on the site was a stone-built one-room or longhouse church surrounded by a four-sided churchyard. Stone churches like this have been uh, documented in both the eastern and in the western settlement and are dated to the period from after 1250-1300. Beneath Beneath the stone church was a Romanesque church with a nave and a smaller chancel. The church was built of wood, stones and cut turfs. When the first Romanesque churches were built in North Greenland is unknown. In Scandinavia they are dated from the middle of the 11th century. The Romanesque churches were surrounded by four-sided cemeteries, so please ignore the circular Dike on the plan. Recent excavations do not support the interpretations from 1932 when the church and the cemetery were excavated. And finally, a third and very small church was located about 150 meters northeast of the two other churches. The small churches were either wooden, as this one is, well, that's a reconstruction of the small so called Chorhill's church. They were either wooden uh, and with protecting turf walls around, as the one here in Kosciasuk, uh, and they could be of stone and turf constructions as well. The, ch the small churches were always surrounded by the circular churchyards. No heathen burials or cemeteries have been recorded in North Greenland. However, a few secondary burials in the churchyards of the small churches might indicate translations 
from Heath and Burroughs. Well, it's not here, but the other one. Still, radiocarbon dates, this is a video, but still, radiocarbon dates on in situ skeletons suggest that the small churches were in use from the initial settlement from around and before 1000, the magical year when the Norwegian <laughs> king Olaf Tryggvason is said to have Christianized the North Atlantic. The radiocarbon dates also suggest that the cemeteries were taken out of use sometime in the beginning of the 1200s, and archaeology suggests that the church buildings were taken out of use at the same time. The sizes of the small churches taken into consideration, they were not built to assemble, assemble large congregations. They were reserved for the church owner, his family and household. Those without churches might not have visited the church very often, and they had to rely and pay for prayers to be said in the churches on their behalf. Important occasions in the life of Christians, such, such as baptism and burial in, the con in consecrated ground, had to take place in a church, and when necessary, the church owners had to make the churches uh, and churchyards available for those without a church for payment. The small churches were not only platforms for the free farmers where they could manifest the, uh, their authority in the society. The churches also became a rather profitable source of income for the church owners. In contrast to the small churches, the introduction of the much larger Romanist churches allowed for larger congregations and the attached channel with the holy altar and where only the clergy had access it, ensured that liturgical ceremonies could be held according to the church laws. Still, the replacement of the small churches didn't alter the capacity of neither the churches nor the cemeteries. The same number of people could go to church and be buried in the cemeteries. But the transformation from the small churches to the larger Romanist churches reduced the number of churches in the settlements. A group of farmers lost their churches and consequently the income from the service of the church, whereas those church owners who managed to transfer the churches into congregational churches apparently gained, of course, as long as they maintained the patronage, patronage of the churches. <coughs> the period between 1000 and 1350 was a time of uh, consolidation of the institutional church in Northern Europe. The purpose was to break loose of the circular certainty and strengthen the integrity of, integrity of the church by introducing a strong infrastructure. The Norwegian Church province was established in 1153, with the archbishop sitting in Nidaros to carry through the organizational plans in Norway and in the North Atlantic. Subsequently, the development of bishoprics and parishes with fixed tithes from the parish parishioners increased within the province. The first bishop to Greenland had already been appointed in the beginning of the 1120s, apparently on the initiative of the Greenlanders themselves. But the first bishop we hear of in the written accounts who actually went to Greenland arrived in 1212. Contrary to Iceland, where two of the most influential families managed to convert their farms into bishop seats and install family members as bishops, <coughs> the bishops in Greenland were always Norwegians. The replacement of the small household-based churches, the introduction of the Romanist church architecture, and the appointment of Norwegian bishops indicate close connections with the institutionalized church and the Norwegian archbishopry. And to understand the development, we have to see the process within a broader geopolitical and economic perspective. Greenland's Iron Age economy was based on a mixture, mixture of animal husbandry and the utilization of wild resources and depended totally on, from day one on the imports of iron, a resource you cannot get in Greenland. Long distance trade with exotic and very valuable Arctic commodities, especially walrus tusk, 
for the European art industry was the driver behind and consolidated the trade between Greenland and the outside. The trade networks in Northern Europe at the time were, driver, were driven by the elite and controlled by the nobility and kings. The market for the very valuable wal walrus tusk had existed for decades before the Greenlanders entered the scene, and they now profited from already established trade networks. The limited variation in trade commodities and the de de dependency of foreign agents, however, made the Greenlanders vulnerable to political and or economic pressure, and clearly the privately owned churches were in focus in the newly established Norwegian church province. Both the church and the Norwegian king accepted to work for the abolition of the privately owned churches, and clearly interruptions or even an embargo on the Greenlandic trade would cause heavy problems in Greenland. In the same period in Iceland, the ecclesiastical landscape developed into a complicated system with multi-classes of churches with rights to church properties shared among ecclesiastical and circular owners. And in many of the small churches, and many of the small churches survived, as we have already heard, as private chapels or prayer houses, indicating that the, the Icelanders at least for a time managed to compromise with Norwegian authorities. Then, does the development in Greenland, where the small churches apparently were demolished and replaced by the later, by the larger Romanist churches, indicate a transfer of all church property from a secular elite to the institutionalized church? I suggest they did not. It would have demanded considerable resources should the church control the churches in the remote Greenlandic settlements even if the church had the support of the Norwegian king. Of course, we cannot exclude the idea that some of the building um, of the more in inclusive Romanist churches were due to piety and the wish to serve God, probably. But seen from a more prosaic point of view, the organization of the clerical landscape in parishes with stable income of tithes might have been more than tempting for some Greenlandic church owners and an understanding between the Norwegian church and kings and some elite farmers in Greenland may have, may have benefited both parties. To the Norwegians, a more or less loyal group of rulers in Greenland would have ensured the profitable trade with the Arctic commodities, uh, and that were better than no trade. And for the Greenlandic elite, the support from the Norwegians could keep them in business and ensure their position in the Greenlandic society. In Greenland, the development polarized, polarized the society. Some farmers and former church owners lost their social prestige and their former income ability, ability while power and authority entered in the hands of a few families with good connections to Norwegian authorities. And that paved the way to an increased dependence on, of Norway the 1262 agreement where the Greenlanders submitted to the Norwegian king and for the building of the unique stone churches that clearly were of the work of professional stone masons, most probably imported from Norway. Thank you.